Hello, my name is Doreen Ellen Beldutan in Svat in Israel. Um, as in my last video, I apologize for the zombie epoxy lifts. Um, the geological events that are occurring in the world are impacting on my body and I'm having various symptoms. So I'm sorry if I look the way I do, but I need to speak with you. With the arrest of uh, Tommy Robinson, uh, the time has come to give this information that I've been preparing the way for, with God's help, for a while. Um, I'm going to be giving things over a little bit more deeply and revealing things a little bit more deeply. And um, the, the, the time has come for us to, to understand what's going on. I'd like to speak about the people who are called the Illuminati, um, what that really is, and um, hopefully their effects on the world uh, will be immediately mitigated and uh, very shortly eradicated. The Rothschild family, whose influence I am certainly not minimizing, they are very, very high level management and uh, they're very capable <laughs> at what they do, um, are important but they are not the bosses. They are upper level management uh, who, like all upper level management, have stock in the ownership, um, but uh, there's a level above them and we're gonna talk about them today because that's a shem with God's help. <clears throat> there are three families um, with whom I wish to um, familiarize you a bit more and explain their significance in the world, what they're doing, and how the world we're living in is operating. The three families are Dan Gu, Sasson, or Sassoon, they're also called. Um, Vidal Sassoon is someone from that family. Um, he's certainly not one of the highest level um, operators, but yes, he is from that family. And another family called uh, Kadoi, uh, who we don't hear very much about at all. These are the families who hail back to Ul Kasdim, which is where Avraham Avinu, our father Avraham, came out from and began the monotheistic religions and enlightened the world about there being one God and their, that God being good and merciful and compassionate. When Israel began to sin widespread, our prophets warned them that they were going to go into exile. What the prophets did not count on, come in and be quiet, behave nicely. What the prophets did not count on would be that uh, there were going to be Jews who were going to return to Babylon and like it there. They thought that uh, it was a, a punishment. Well, there were rabbis who went back there and they were just delighted to be in Babylon. You have heard about the Illuminati. The word Illum in Hebrew actually means hidden. The way these families spell their names gives more insight into what the light is. The, 
the dark light, I would call it. Um, U or O is light in Semitic languages. The person who calls, the, the family who call themselves Dan Gu are integrating that light concept into their names. Uh, an, uh, an anagram of Dan Gu would be Gondao, which is a very, very high level um, officer in, in the Israeli prison system, for instance. Uh, the highest ranking uh, prisoner prisoner officers are called uh, uh, gondarim. Le gander is also to um, wear very, very uh, fancy uh, clothes and, and uh, make much of oneself insofar as how one looks on the outside. Naim Dangul um, who gratefully is not in this world anymore, uh, renewed a title for himself that hasn't been used since the 13th century. That title is Rosh Gola. Translated it into English as the Exilarch. It also has another meaning. Gol, Gal, is a pile of stones. Rosh Gola would then become the top stone in the, in the pile of stones. That is the capstone. That's the whole thing with the capstone. Oh, the, like the pyramid on the American dollar bill and all that. It's what he called himself, is Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to be linking to some information about him. In one of the photos of him, you'll see that um, this nice Jewish boy is walking around with an upside-down cross uh, pinned on him. His father was the largest seller of Arab books. His grandfather was the chief rabbi of Baghdad. Now you can call Iraq Iraq all you want, but it will always be Babylon. And these people are still connected to Babylon, and that is still their center of operations, although they're living in Britain. Another family is Sassoon, or Sasson. Um, they make much ado about uh, being connected to uh, the, the Davidic dynasty. Not, of all, of, not all of David's uh, sons were uh, so, uh, how shall I say, morally upright. They made a fortune in the opium trade in China. And there's another family, Kadoi. Not much is known about them. Um, on the internet I can't find much. Maybe some people in Britain uh, can find out more about them. These are the people who go back all the way in time to the Babylonian, Mesopotamian, Assyrian empires of dark magic. The town that Avraham came out of is called Ul Kasdim. And in different Semitic languages, the oats, the, the letter Sian is sometimes pronounced as Shian. We can read O Kasdim as O Keshedim, which would make it the light like demons. The word shade comes from that, you know, being in the shade. All of the Babylonian cultic practices involve blood sacrifice, most especially child sacrifice. And it still goes on. In fact, more than ever, they have gotten to a point of it being on, on an industrial level. And the time is coming 
to put a final end to that. And that is why the planet Earth now is uh, so um, energetic and disquiet. Uh, you, we can see uh, from the volcanoes going off, the volcano in Hawaii, there are other active volcanoes. The most active right now is, is, is the one in Hawaii. We can see that it's both an outpouring and a purification, but at the same time, it's hell on Earth. This is what's going on, the very core of Earth. The word core, by the way, which is core, heart, right? Core is also a, um, a reactor, like, like a nuclear reactor is called a core. All of this, the, the, the heart of the Earth itself is reacting and pouring out because the, the, the final confrontation between good and evil is now taking place. In order to explain to you how the learning of the Talmudic, uh, the, the Babylonian Talmud, impacts on the world, it helps to know what cymatics is. I recommend a lecture in cymatics that was given at uh, TED, as part of the TED uh, uh, um, series of lectures. I recommend... Uh, the TED lecture because cymatics is really very, very important. It talks about how sound impacts on the world and forms. forms. Uh, um, and immediately when information like that is revealed, the, the, the dark mu magicians come in and overtake it and make it kooky. Um, I'm not interested in all that kooky stuff. I have, I have no uh, patience for that. When you know about God, you, you're not into spiritual, kooky, uh, New Age uh, stuff. If a person can't integrate it into their ordinary life without sounding like trippy man, they don't know what they're talking about. Anytime something talks about spirituality, you're talking about the occult. I don't do that crap. The Cymatics Lecture and Ted talks about it from a, a rational, scientific, such as it is, point of view. Sound impacts on matter. Sound waves create forms. The word Talmud, meaning learning, is an anagram of the word moledet, which means land of birth. What the Babylonian magicians did was they turned the Babylonian Talmud into their moledet. They wanted to do away with the level of reality that is called Yisrael. I talked about that in my last video. I don't want to repeat in order to keep things uh, within a reasonable framework of time. Normally, I don't like um, to refer to, to Hollywood memes and, and, and this kind of stuff. I don't think that people should be um, pinning their real consciousness on stuff that, that's given over in Hollywood. But there is a scene in the, 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 the movie The Matrix, it, it, it's done horribly, but the point of it is very, very important. You see a baby, like all like plugged in, and that baby is acting as a battery producing energy. The way it really works is from the time Jewish children are small, Jewish boys are small, they are told that they have to learn the Talmud in order to know how to do the mitzvot. Now this is arrant nonsense because gematria of Yisrael, Israel is ha-mitzvot, Israel is the mitzvot. So what happens if we are the actual commandments 
living commandments, what happens when boys are told to use their real body, their real being, to produce ceremonies? Not to just live in a holy way, but to act out ceremonies. What happens? The uh, unreality is introduced into the creation. Understand what I'm saying now. Unreality does not necessarily exist, or even the possibility of unreality, until real Jews do fake things with their bodies, and then there is a platform for bullshit. And that is what our children are inducted into. That is the slavery that our children are made to do. To sit and learn the Talmud and provide the power for creating Babylon. We do not need to learn how to do ceremonies. Torah is not a book of ceremonies. It is the book of life. And from Torah, all worlds can be created. And that is what we are meant to know how to do. But instead, the children are taught by the rabbis who are funded by the by the Dangors, by the Sassons, by the Kaduris. These people fund education on all levels. Take a look at the links that I'm going to provide and you'll see how deeply involved in education they are here and in Britain. And so these children learn the Talmud and when they do what they're pronouncing in Hebrew and to a certain extent in Aramaic too because it's, it's close to Hebrew is creating the forms of Babylon that is the child sacrifice but there's more to it Instead of creating Israel, which is not a country and not a geographical place, it is a moral accomplishment, they create Babylon unknowingly. But the people that are funding these yeshivas, they know. And the rabbis, and, and, and there, there are photos, please look at my, my Facebook. These rabbis are walking around wearing crosses that says for God and the Empire. What? I'm sorry, I, I'm, this is like all filtering through my body and it's not easy. few days before the American Embassy opened, there were very, very heavy rains here. And there was an area that was flooded where teenagers were sent to go on an excursion. Ten teenagers died there. They themselves were afraid to go. They were given warnings not to go. They were sent there, they were made to go within the framework of an army, pre-army preparation program. And they drowned. Because before the American embassy could be moved to Jerusalem, which is not the same thing as Yerushalayim, they needed blood sacrifices. All of these wars, every war, and you listen to me now, 
is all about blood sacrifice. That's all it is on an industrial level. Babylon is powered by misery. The sacrifice itself is more to the power, to the purpose of creating the negative power that results from mass misery. It's very interesting in the state of Israel. We're hardly ever involved in, 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 in collective celebration, and when we do, it's some kind of nonsense like what happened at the Eurovision concert. Right, So we should all be happy about the fact that somebody made a fool of herself in front of the whole world. We're united in national mourning all the time, and this is exactly, exactly what the Babylonian cult was. This is what it was. They used to cry about Tammuz, dying and all the women would wail and cry and misery and, 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 and there would be sacrifices and all kinds of things. Well, they don't do it that way anymore for two reasons. One, so you shouldn't recognize it for what it is. And number two, the technology now allows it to be done much more sophisticated. What that does is create a the reality that we're living in. Reality does not have to look the way it is. I'll give you an example. There's a lot of talk about aliens. I'm going to tell you what all this talk about aliens is. The Hebrew word for the Most High is Elyon. There are no other planets It only looks to us like there are other planets because we are in a state of such dissociation as a result of being told all kinds of Babylonian bullshit about what time is, about what history is, about all kinds of disassociation about instead of being told that the people, that the figures that we see in Torah are us. We're told that it's somebody else who lived long ago and far away and the total total schizophrenia. So is it any wonder that we think that that the light that we're seeing, which seems so far away to us because we are in such darkness, are other planets? There are no other planets! The planet that is called Jupiter in Hebrew is tzedek, which means righteousness, We were told it's another planet so that there shouldn't be righteousness on earth. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We are told that the sun is far away and too hot to touch and impossibly... Bullshit! That's all wisdom that we have been removed from. And all of these illusions are being created by these Babylonian warlocks and witches. And let me tell you something else, too. Do not believe this crap about the men being in charge of it. It's the women in these families. Women have always had the power for good and for bad. We give birth to everything. And if you notice in this world, there's an awful lot of women being involved in child trafficking. It's the women that are inducting people into the trafficking. It's the women selling the kids. There is no evil. There is no evil, and you listen to me now, like a woman who has no compassion. Compassion in Hebrew is rachamim, which is the plural for wombs. It is a woman who kills that which comes out of her own womb.
if we are to live in a world in which being meek and gentle and kind is not dangerous, is not reason to be put in jail, is not reason to be put in mental institutions. We have to get to the root of this Babylonian cult, which is creating the platform. It, it, it creates a world in which evil is physically possible, in which it can be carried out. This is not necessarily the case. The money has to be turned off to the yeshivas where the boys are sitting and learning Talmud. I know that there's going to be a hue and cry and it's going to be anti-Semitism and, 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 and cut off the blood supply to the machine that is creating all of the evil that is in this world. Don't worry, those boys will not stop learning Torah. They will start learning Torah. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Doreen Ellen Beldotan in Sfat in Israel. I'm making a second part of uh, the video that uh, I started, um, Meet the Rothschilds Bosses. Very pleased that it was uh, popular. I got a thousand views on it in the first day, which is, I think, a world record for me. <laughs> I'm still a little, uh, so please excuse me, but I think I look almost human, right? I can smile and everything. Um, in order to understand what's going on in the world uh, today in general, one has to understand um, the Jews' uh, uh, betrayal of the covenant that we made with God when... Um, some of us went into Babylon and liked it there. There was one prophet who saw that the Babylonian exile was, was going to be um, a protracted exile, that the Jews were going to like it there, was Yirmiyahu. He saw it, which is what made him so sad. Uh, most of the, the prophets, as I said, um, didn't think the Jews were going to like it there much, that they were going to get to Babylon, be sorry, and uh, regret what they did and, and want to come back home. He understood that the Jews were going to like it. And this this is why his, his book is, is, is so terribly heartbroken. Um, but it's also promising. And we are now fulfilling the prophecy of, of our holy teacher, Yirmiyahu. And we're going to see the return of what's called Sherich Israel, those who remained loyal to Israel, those who remained Israel, the return to Israel. Before that happens, there are going to be all kinds of um, upheavals in the world, and we see that happening. Uh, it's all under control. If you take a look at what's going on in Hawaii, you see that despite uh, an unprecedented uh, in known history explosion of, of, a, uh, of a volcano, it's very, very controlled. Um, there are floods going on, as we know. Uh, this is not the result of the Illuminati um, uh, doing this. Uh, quite the opposite. It's the level above. <laughs> the Illuminati who are using their own hands and their own equipment to bring that about because I told you that you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools uh, but the master of the master can so we're just showing them who's boss. I bought this book called The Sephardi Story some years ago it's written by the name of Chaim Raphael. I guess I should say Chaim Raphael. Right? <laughs> A celebration of Jewish history. 
such as it is. And um, I looked into this because when my mother, Alea Shalom, was ill, a series of blood samples were run on her, and um, they found that we are not Ashkenazim as we thought, that we are uh, very, very uh, Mizrahi. They told my mother she had blood that they, they'd never seen anything like this in North America. She said, you have a blood sample like you walked out of the Middle East yesterday. So I began to look into uh, what this means, and I bought this book. And it was in this book that I learned about um, a Dangu, the Dangor family, for the first time. And uh, it says, in a different form again, the personal side of the Sephardi story has been given new life in our time through the Exilarch's foundation of Naim Dangur, whose magazine, The Scribe, unifies the family memories of Sepharad, uh, Eastern Sephardim all over the world. In this book, we're going to see just how deep the connection to of the Jews became to Babylon. We're going to begin to understand what that brought in the world, and we're going to begin to understand why, uh, despite the temporary inconvenience, uh, the decision has been made on high to plow it under and uh, wash it away. So I'm going to read some short excerpts, which are very telling from this book, and you'll understand things that are talked about, about the Jews and the Illuminati and all kinds of things in misunderstood ways in a far more clear kind of way. He writes, In one sense, indeed, the Sephardi story begins with the origin of the patriarch Abraham in Babylonia and the reformulation there of Jewish life at a later stage in history. From this we understand that by going back to Babylon and, and, and taking up residence there and liking it there, those Jews committed the worst kind of betrayal of the covenant that Hashem made with Avraham. Avraham said to, to uh, Hashem said to Avraham, Lech lecha, go, go out, get out of here. And here they are coming back. It is not always realized how strong the links of this golden age with the continued Jewish settlement is in Babylon. The authority exercised by the Jews of Babylon had its roots many centuries earlier during the exiles of the Jews from their kingdoms in Israel in the 7th and 6th centuries BCE. The exiles had established a rich life there. They had their own ruler, the Exilarch, and now he renews the Exilarch, right? A descendant of King David. Jewish history and law enshrined in the Bible. Enshrined in the Bible? What is it, dead? Was now the source of a new diffusion of Jewish experience spreading from Babylonian academies across the world. It was this free-flowing Jewish culture from Babylon that laid the base in time for the meaningful survival of Jews everywhere in the world. Oh, so without that, our, mean, our lives wouldn't be meaningful. I want you to understand the mentality of how these traitors think about Babylon. Over thousands of years, the ebb and flow of the Jewish presence there, meaning Babylon, has taken many forms, notably the outstanding role played by Jews in administration and finance, with its influence spreading today into many countries of the Sephardi diaspora. On a world scale, it was from Iraq that a number of Jews spread powerfully and beneficially into the Indian and Chinese empires, opening up and transforming the Far East to lasting effect. First of all, I want you to understand that everything you, that is going on now with the wars in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Iran, this is all going back to Babylon, 
to the Assyrian Empire, to the Mesopotamian Empires. This is what is being cleared away. But when it says here they spread powerfully and beneficially into the Indian and Chinese empires, like what? Opium? Building opulent hotels? Like what kind of ben beneficial things did they, they bring these countries? If anything, they brought them absolute misery. It is therefore only one phase of this tradition that in our own time, prominent Sephardi personalities from Iraq emerged as they, as they had before to exert their traditional influence on the, on the Jewish world at large. They are trying to take over. They are trying to make the whole world into Babylon. And we're going to talk about this, please God. Names are far too numerous to list, but perhaps one can perhaps mention two that are symbolic. The first would be Naim Dangur, grandson of the famous Hacham Bashi, chief rabbi Hacham Ezra Dangur, and an imaginative projector from his base in London of a new expression of the central role of the Exilarch in times gone by. In 1970, exactly 700 years after the death in, in 1270 of the last known Exilarch, Naim Dangor established the Exilarch's foundation, endowed with funds to help the young, but on a broader basis to restore the links everywhere of Jews of Babylonian descent through a journal he called The Scribe, sent all, all over the world. And then they speak about another, but I want to, to, to concentrate on that. Um, <clears throat> in, an in an equally distinctive way, the memory of Babylon is celebrated by the philanthropists. They all call themselves philanthropists. That, that's, a, that's a watchword for uh, misanthropist. Dr. David Salah who played a dominant role in education and Zionist work in Iraq itself, followed now in England, where he and his wife Irene, until her sad death this year, developed highly personal programs on a very large scale to help Sephardi youths in Israel to rise to their full potential. Charabalebin. Everything was done to... To, to trample Sephardim underfoot in the state of Israel. There is no more powerful uh, 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 illustration. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm going to go back. These local loyalties have, in, have uh, enduring meaning, even if in Israel today, the common purpose might seem to transcend them. He's, listen to what he's saying. He's saying that in Israel today they might seem to be transcending their, their loyalties to Babylon, but don't you be fooled, we're still do, deeply rooted in Babylon. Woo -hoo. There is no more powerful illustration of this than the theme which surfaces so often in this book, the ancient attachment of the Jews to Babylon. One sometimes feels that it has a quasi-mystic quality of the kind that is echoed, strangely enough, in the words of an old English nursery rhyme. How many miles to Babylon? Three score miles and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. Now listen carefully. Tradition relates that Akkad was built 2300 BC. Now watch what, he, uh, watch what he did. First he said BCE. Now he calls it BC. All of a sudden his loyalties switch. He starts to speak in Christian terms. By a mighty ruler named Sargon, who had been cast out and later rescued as an infant, just as, as is told of Moses a thousand years later. Sargon created an empire stretching as far as Anatolia to the north and beyond Assyria to the east. Why is this important today? Because when Trump 
opened up the American embassy in Yerushalayim. No, he didn't. I would correct myself. In Jerusalem, he has never set foot in Yerushalayim. And the way he's going, he never will. They coined a coin. The showing Trump's face superimposed upon that of Sargon. Not Darius, who who allowed the Jews to return to Israel and, and rebuild the temple, but Sargon, the person who, who founded the Akkadian Empire. And in a video that they made, they take this uh, coin and they show it on a model of the third temple. Netanyahu three times mentions the temple in his speech at the new embassy. So we understand that what they're planning on doing is building the third temple in accordance with Babylon. In other words, what they, the new world order, what they plan is the final incursion, the final takeover of Israel by Babylon. Good luck with that, folks. Let me remind you, Israel is situated on a tectonic fault. Just saying. Behind all the law expressed in the Bible is the belief, wholly original to Israel, that moral action is imitatio dei, is the imitation of God. Moral action, not spirituality, not contemplation, moral action. That is what we are on about. Israel is to be a holy nation reaching out to God's holiness. That is absolutely correct. So what is it that they do in Babylon? The Bible texts expressing this are linked indissolubly to the Holy Land itself. Correct. They are given as motivational force behind the exodus from Egypt and the achievement of a homeland fulfilling God's promise to Avraham. Correct. Yet, what do you mean yet? Yet, one has to note, perhaps with awe, that it was in Babylon during the first exile from the Holy Land that supreme emphasis was put on this spiritual aspect of Torah teaching. Did you just get what he said? First, he says, correctly so, that the land is indissolubly connected with moral action. Action. In Babylon, all of a sudden, this becomes spiritual. So what they do is they introduce spirituality into, into Torah. There's no spirituality in Torah. Torah is the translation of God's will into actuality. We're not on about spirituality at all. We're on about actuality. They introduce spirituality, which, as I've said before, and will probably say again, is the occult. Okay. But in the meantime, I'm not reading the whole thing so as not to bore you too much. In the lead up to the age of Hillel, authority had to flow, had to flow, from devoted Bible teachers in the Holy Land, but they flowed into Babylon. They started to leave Israel and go to Babylon. And it says here, in political terms, this emphasis became less dominating after the temple had been rebuilt. Members of the priestly clan exploited their authority to win power and wealth, which is exactly what they want to do in the rebuilding of this uh, Kakamemi uh, third temple of theirs. In an atmosphere of corruption and social unrest. First you create an atmosphere of corruption and social unrest, and then you use it. Hmm. But if this, as in the writings of Josephus, show was the pu was the public pattern, there it was the public pattern. There must also have been an untold story which flowed 
directly from Ezra's exposition of the Torah and which reached back to the beginning of Torah study in Babylon itself. This, in effect, is how it was that a Babylonian, Hillel, could become the rabbinic leader of the Jews in Israel. And let me tell you, when the Dead Sea, the Jews at the Dead Sea, who wrote uh, Amigilot, who wrote uh, the, the, the Dead Sea sect, I don't want to call them a sect, spoke about an evil rabbi. The timeline in which they speak about an evil rabbi puts it right at Hillel. Hillel, in the rabbinical uh, tradition, is revered. But the Jews who, who left Jerusalem and settled in, in, in Qumran and wrote the Megillot had a different story to tell about him about he persecuted the righteous priests. And it was Hillel who is said to have instituted prose bull, which allowed for usury and, and gave a, a, a legalistic out for not allowing the Jews to have their land back every seven years in the sabbatical year. And eventually they did away with the Yovlot, the Jubilees, altogether. This, in effect, is how it was that a Babylonian Hillel could become the rabbinic leader of the Jews in Israel. Bible study had, con had continued in Babylon after the, and he puts it like in one quote, the return. In other words, he's saying there never really was a return, that they always had their center in Babylon. So he doesn't take the Jews who wanted to come back to Israel seriously at all, the return, like putting it in quotes ready, as we shall see, to reach the high standards of Israel itself. So they start to now compete with Israel. Half-jokingly, the Jews of Babylon would claim that they were superior to those of Israel. They would never dispute the basic holiness of Jerusalem with which nothing could compare, but, I mean but, with the yet, with the but, Get it? Ifs, ands, and buts, and yets. But in material terms, they were far more prosperous. And the head of their self government, the Reish Galuta, the head of the exile, which I told you is also called the capstone, was a direct descendant of King David, or so they claimed. All countries said one rabbi are second rate com compared to the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is second rate compared with Babylonia. This is a bad translation. Let me tell you what it actually says. It says that all countries are the dough for the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is the dough for Babylon. In other words, what he's saying is, you know the expression half-baked? Well, he's saying not baked at all. In other words, what he's trying to say was the land of Israel was just the dough for, for Babylon, which is the actual bread. Really. But the Holy Land was still weakening in its leadership and the Jewish people compared with the burgeoning strength of Babylon, to, compared with the burgeoning strength of Babylon. Reversing the earlier trend, the flow of scholars was now from Palestine to Babylon. Listen to what he does. Listen to what he does. First he was calling it Israel. Now, when he starts to talk about reversing the flow of, of rabbis leaving Israel and going to Babylon, he suddenly calls it Palestine. Ooh. So now we know where all of this uh, fomenting the idea of Palestine comes from. Naim Dan Gur's father was the largest supplier of books in Arabic in the world, as I said in my last video. Is there a more perfect vehicle for brainwashing the Arab masses? Half of his family have Arabic names. Yeah even when there are 
Hebrew um, equivalents of those names. And all of a sudden they're talking about Palestine. So now we know that it's not the Palestinians who were the origin of all of this propaganda about Israel not belonging to the Jews. It's the Babylonians, the traitors, the Jews themselves are fomenting this idea that the Jews are in Palestine. No, darlings, the Jews are in Israel. The turning point had come in A.D. 219. Now, this is interesting. First, he talked about B.C.E., before the Christian era. Then he talked about B.C. All of a sudden, he's sounding like a, like a Christian, sort of. Now he's talking A.D. So who exactly are these, these people's gods? Huh? They're a little bit loyal to Allah, and they're a little bit loyal to Jesus, and they're a little bit loyal to, you know, it's like a mishmash here. Yeah. And a little bit probably to the Akkadian gods and the Babylonian gods. You know that they renamed all of the names of the Hebrew months with the names of Babylonian gods. Do you know that? Every name of all of the Hebrew months today is the name of a Babylonian deity. Really. Okay. The, re the turning point came in A.D. 219 with the arrival there of a distinguished rabbi, Rabbi Aricha, affectionately known as Rab. Working with a Babylonian rabbi called Shmuel, Rab founded study centers um, <clears throat> through which the fame of Babylonian scholarship became universally acknowledged. The population of Babylon had been described by Josephus in his book Jewish Antiquities as countless myriads of which none can know the number. Philo, the Jewish philosopher in Alexandria, had written in the same vein of the very large number of Jews in every city in the lands beyond the Euphrates. The two major yeshivot academies founded or expanded by Rab and Shmuel were at Sura and Nahadea, Oxford and Cambridge of Jewish Babylonia. Oh, really? And perhaps that's the reason why they have those Pasha accents. Both academies attracted masses of ordinary people who turned to study side by side with ordinary work as an enlargement of life. In each year, work in the fields came to a standstill in Adar, which is the name of one of their Babylonian gods, February, March. And in Elul, <laughs> I don't even need to say one. August, September, it was then that the students flocked to the academies in Rob's time Sura alone had 1,200 regular students. Nahadea was succeeded after a time by a similar academy in Pumbedita. And additional academies were founded elsewhere in Babylonia. But the two major academies remained the pivot of Jewish life respected throughout the world. And that is the reason why you have Cambridge and Oxford in Israel today, according in Nehu. <laughs> in England today <laughs> from my mouth to God's ears um, on this model um, okay it talks about the the Jews large uh, extensive land holdings the exilarch not surprisingly was the greatest landowner These are merely some aspects of Jewish study and economic existence in Babylonia while the foundations were being laid for its unique role in taking over from the Holy Land in many respects. I am talking to you about the plan of Hasatan to take over from Hashem. Do you understand me? 
the plan was to wrest the earth from Hashem. Understand what is being talked about here. Good luck with that, boys and girls. <laughs> yes. Now listen. Iraq Jews carried the trade of their land to Central Asia, India, and beyond, and some of the emissaries of Babylon and Persian Jews to Bukhara served as viziers in the courts of the emirs and the great moguls of India. Now listen. Historically, he feels, the Jews of Persia had their own distinction. It was through their emissaries that the Khazars of Asia Minor adopted the Jewish faith in the 8th century. So who was it who converted the Khazars? Who was it who converted the, the Khazars? Real Jews? Babylonian traders? Right. So the problem is not that the Khazars were converted to Judaism and who's descended from them. It's that they never were converted to Judaism. They were converted to Babylonian heresy. Avraham Avinu, our father Avraham, Vesara were the first converts. To be a real convert, to be a convert like, like, like Avraham, to be a convert like Wut, Ruth, is a very, very high esteemed level. Halavai I wish I could get to that kind of a level. The Khazars weren't converted like that. They didn't, they weren't converted by those who were loyal to the promise that Hashem had made to Avraham, that we were going to inherit the land. The land doesn't mean one geographical, it means physicality itself, that we were going to be able to express God's will in actuality, that God was going to be able to, to, to do the absolute impossible and translate, even even Ein Sof doesn't describe God. There are no descriptions for God. There are no descriptions for God. There's no conceptions, no descriptions, no nothing. It was going to translate itself into actuality and be able to be able to experience, be experienced in actuality. This was the plan. And it wasn't the Jews who were loyal to that who converted the Khazars. It was the Jews who were, con who were lo loyal to Babylon. They got to Babylon, they saw the, the, the hanging gardens, which are symbolic of, of, of the spirituality, right? It's the gardens, the flowers that never touch the ground. They sort of like hang on the vines, you know. They liked that stuff. They liked that spiritual stuff because they didn't have the moral blast. They didn't have the chops to be able to hack real Judaism. Today, there are a there is a, 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 a renaissance of the desire to t return to Israel, and that does not mean I am not making a political statement. I am making a an eschatological statement. I am making a a cosmic statement. I am making a statement of of absolute truth. There are Jews who want to fulfill the promise, the covenant that God and Avraham made, and make this world into the translation insofar as the physical world can be a vehicle for infinite holiness. This is happening. In order for that to happen, we have to clear away the crust. You know, when this, when this thing on my lips began, it happened to, like right around Pesach. It was really strange. Like, I started like cracking and bleeding. And, and, and I said to my, my husband, you know, I, I have a feeling this, this doesn't feel like a biological thing happen, happening. This feels more like a, um, like a, 
a, ge a, a geological event. It was really, really bizarre. It was like being encrusted with sand and little rocks. And it was awful. And it was a very, very unpleasant feeling. And I said to my, I said to my husband, I said, and I said to myself, something is happening. Something is going to happen. And, and day, within days, the, 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 the volcano erupted in, in, in uh, Hawaii. And there was massive uh, volcanic activity and, and earthquakes all over the planet. And I knew, I knew that the Jews had reached the core. I knew that we had gotten down to the core of what Earth is supposed to be and that there was this outflowing of burning all the, the, the garbage away. And you mark my words, if Hashem chose for that volcano to be in Hawaii, there's some kind of like really nasty kind of something going on in Hawaii. It didn't just happen. But it's not the only place that there's volcano, volcanic activity. All of that has to be cleared away. It will be done in a very... Believe me when I tell you, this is under absolutely perfect control. <laughs> Trust my teachers. <laughs> They're very, very old. <clears throat> there will be floods. There will be volcanoes. There are going to be earthquakes. There's going to be a lot of seismic activity. Earth is renewing itself and purifying itself and we are going to establish what our holy teacher Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah the prophet, called the renewal of the covenant. It is not the New Testament. It is the renewal of the covenant. And please God, I'll talk more about what earth is and what that covenant is in another video. This has been long enough. For the time being, though, I wanted you to understand why it is absolutely critical that we plow down the top layer of crusting and get that out of the way. So hold on. There are going to be some upheavals, uh, but I promise you it's all under control. And um, this is; these are only good signs. Thank you for listening. And look, I can smile.